And uh, so without any further ado here, I think we will just go ahead and get started on the first talk. So the first talk is Meng Sen Zhang from Stanford University. And Meng Sen is going to tell us about intrinsic dynamic landscape of the brain shaped by multi-scale structural constraints. So go ahead and share your screen and take it away whenever you are ready. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, so yet, yeah, as uh, Megan mentioned, I will talk about how the intrinsic dynamic landscape of the brain uh, is shaped by structure. So when I think about the structure of the brain, I think a little bit more abstractly. I think about uh, a bunch of uh, nodes connected by some arrows that are the structure constraints. And these nodes could be neurons or brain regions or even functional networks. So there are you can be represented in, in of structure of uh, multiple skills. And so are the connections um, uh, between them. So a fundamental question for the brain is, we want to know how these structures uh, are connected to what's going on in the brain, the dynamics. And today I will primarily be talking about how the uh, structure of the brain constrains its function. So first I will give you a like a little conceptual overview of what do I mean by constrain. And the structure not only constrain a single function, but a repertoire of multiple functions. So I will focus on uh, dynamics as a repertoire. And then I will talk about using a model to show you how the dynamic repertoire of a single brain region can be controlled or constrained by its local connectivity. And then how a large scale network can connect these uh, local regions and synergize their dynamic repertoire. And eventually I will connect this to the data. In particular, I want to know what is the feature of the dynamic repertoire of the model will reflect something such as the functional connectivity patterns observed in human fMRI. So I will begin with uh, the dynamics of a single brain region. First, why do I say constrain rather than determine? So I want to bring in the concept of multi-stability. Multi-stability means that um, for the same system, multiple viable patterns are achievable, but which pattern is selected depends on the external input or intrinsic noise uh, and other factors that are not structural. So in a sort of a cartoonish way, I think of structure really determines the dynamic landscape of the brain. And what is happening on the landscape are the dynamics that are actually observed. For example, we can say that these two points on the landscape represent two different um, patterns of this single brain region. And if you perturb it a little bit, uh, then you will relax back to these patterns of activation. So these patterns are stable and we call them attractors. And complementarily, if the brain is po poised at this point, um, if you perturb the pattern a little bit, then it will fall into either of these basins. And this is called a repeller. So what is really going to happen in the brain does not only depends on the shape of the landscape, also where are the perturbations going and uh, where the system is starting in this landscape. So it's constrained, not determined. And when we try to visualize or understand, represent how the landscape is going to change as we vary the structure or other parameters, we usually keep track of the position of these attractors and represent them in a lower dimensional space. And that's what we call a bifurcation diagram. So in the bifurcation diagram, the original landscape is sort of compressed into a single slice in this diagram. And the point where an attractor would disappear as the landscape changes is called a bifurcation. So you can sort of estimate the, uh, the functional complexity of this, uh, this system by looking at how many colored stripe there is in this bifurcation diagram, which are the number of attractors. The more stripes, the, there are more attractors and there are more functional complexity. And now if we use a non-cartoonish model, which actually have uh, biophysical constraints, 
and it describes um, two interacting populations uh, of neurons. One excitatory, the other is inhibitory, and with some um, excitatory and inhibitory connections and some external input to the system. And when we look at their bifurcation diagram, we will notice that if there is an insufficient amount of excitatory recurrent connectivity in this region, then no matter how much input you put into the system, it will always only have one attractors. It does not have multi-stability. So we call this a monostable system. If there is more excitatory recurrent connectivity in the system or in this brain region, then for certain levels of input, we will have at least two attractors. And this gives the multi-stability of this brain region. So what I've told you is that the local complexity of the multi-stability of the region is depending on its recurrent connectivity, but it also depends on what levels of input other region may give it. So the complexity of the whole brain, you can imagine, will be depending on how you plug these uh, different regions to each other. And that gives us the uh, global network model where we connect all these lo uh, uh, local models into a large scale network with these dash lines that are representing long range connections. And as we have more regions and the model becoming a little bit more complex, and so is the landscape. And so here, just to show you some intuition, and this is a toy example, I show you a two dimensional landscape uh, that represent the coordinate uh, the activation patterns of uh, two regions that is a left and right hemisphere. And to be able to do a bifurcation diagram for this landscape, uh, so in a relatively low dimensional space, I just simply calculate the average of the activation pattern for each of the attractors from A1 to A4, fictionally here. But in the real uh, model, the bifurcation diagram will look something like this. And here I'm showing you what happens if the long range connection between the regions are uniform. So every brain region is connected to other regions in the same way. And at best for certain level of overall strengths of long range coupling, you will have three, maximumly three attractors. And they represent really boring uniform activation patterns over the whole brain. However, if you use the human connectome from the human connectome project to define the long range connectivity, the dash lines here, you will have a very densely populated uh, uh, bifurcation diagram with a lot of attractor for uh, each level of global coupling. So, and these attractors correspond to much subtler patterns of activation than what you've seen on the left. So I've showed you that if you have in realistic long range connections in this global network, they can greatly amplify the local complexity uh, of, of the regions. What is also interesting here is that as your activation patterns becoming more subtle, you will notice that the brain regions are not necessarily being activated altogether as on the left hand side. So I want to bring your attention back to this toy model that what I mean is if your brain is starting in this state, this landscape determines not only the repertoire of attractors, it also determines what kind of transitions are possible. If you are here, you can either activate your left hemisphere or right hemisphere or both together. But if there are some reason that the landscape is undergoing certain change, if it take the B route, then the left and right hemisphere can only be activated together. If it took the C route, then the left and right hemisphere can only be activated independently. So to quantify how this uh, landscape will constrain how the brain regions coordinate across these attractors during the transition, we can lease all the attractors abstractly in the matrix and calculate a rank correlation. And that will give us a correlation coordination matrix uh, across different attractors between regions. And he, you have a zero entry in this, uh, this spot, means that the left and right hemisphere are pretty much acting independently as they traverse this landscape. In contrast, 
the left and right hemisphere will coordinate positively if it's taking the, the landscape is in, in this shape. Um, but their coordination will be negatively uh, if the um, left and right hemisphere can only be activated independently across the tractors. So if I take a slice of this bifurcation diagram um, that's constrained by the human connectum and show the uh, coordination of brain regions across all these attractors, I will get something look like this. So here, the region were indexed, uh, these are the, all the right hemisphere regions and symmetrically left hemisphere regions. And you can see some large scale symmetry in this cross attractor coordination matrix. And uh, this symmetry between the upper left and uh, lower left reflects the similarity be between the functional connectivity within the hemisphere and across hemisphere with the homologous regions. And when I look at this, I thought, oh, that looks really similar to the human functional connectivity. But it was very different from uh, some earlier um, theoretical exploration that I did when I was simply simulating the brain near a single attractor. And this is a best case scenario. And what is fundamentally lacking is a large scale symmetry between the functional similar connectivity within hemisphere and across hemisphere. And in fact, in, within the tractor coordination look very much like the structural uh, connectivity. And what is really happening here is that the cross attractor coordination better captures the nonlinear dependency of function on structure. And finally, I want to say that the, 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 the transitions are not come, does not come for free. So they are associated with certain biophysically interpretable energy gaps. And if we quantify this energy gap in different functional networks of the brain, then we will observe that the ratio of the energy consumption between the default mode network and other networks will be greater than one for most of the conditions. It means that the default mode network dominates the energy consumption of the model brain. And this energy levels of energy consumption, what the dominance will be modulated by the local recurrent connectivity. And with that, I want to uh, show some take home messages. I hope you will remember after this, this talk that the functional complexity, the repertoire of all possible function stable patterns are shaped by structural, structural connectivity across multiple skills. And that the functional connectivity that we observe in uh, such as observing human fMRI uh, uh, data, it might reflect the transitions between stable patterns of brain activities uh, even more than the stable activity patterns themselves. So um, with that, I want to uh, conclude and take any questions. Thank you. That was great. Um, and in lieu of applause, because we can't do that in Zoom, if you enjoyed the talk, please drop some praise in the chat. Uh, so um, we have time for a couple quick questions, maybe. So if you have a question, please drop it in the Q&A box. But while those are rolling in, I just have a very quick, maybe kind of elementary question, um, which is this constraint on the connectivity patterns um, due to the structural connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, how much flexibility is there? Um, this is all resting state functional connectivity, right? And so like we know that also functional connectivity can change due to task you know, constraints and so on. So uh, do you have any plans or how would you build that into your model to actually like push around on variations in this landscape so that you could actually look at functional connectivity as a result of task or task condition? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And, um, and there are multiple ways to look at it. There are a lot of possibilities of how this could be further studies. And I'm only showing you a, I would say an elementary quantification of what is going on with this landscape. So um, the, what the functional connectivity is really depends on how um, uh, locally and globally you're looking at the landscape. So right now I'm quantifying the coordination across the entire landscape. So we imagine that it will converge to a 
resting state functional connectivity and would be better for long time recording of functional connectivity. So, um, but you can also look at this um, uh, more locally. You can have a part of the landscape mm -hmm. and you see where that locally, what, what type of transitions are possible. Um, but that's, there are a lot of possibility of what kind of analysis could be done uh, with this kind of framework. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try to do some of it. Um, but there are a lot of possibilities. Sounds great, thanks. So um, unfortunately, the other questions came in a little bit late. So